spotlight session on strategies to engage girls, boys, men, women, and entire communities in delivering change. Uh, I'll be introducing you to a wonderful group of panelists sitting to my right. Um, my name is Eric Levine. I'm from the STARS Foundation, uh, heavily um, supportive of grassroots and community efforts like those which we'll be hearing today. Um, before we kick off our session um, with our panelists, we're very honored uh, to have with us as a, as a father of a young daughter, an inspirational father on the subject of uh, men being involved in, in supporting girls, um, Zayuddin Yousafzai. Um, who is here to share um, not only uh, what he's most famous for, uh, perhaps as Malala's father, but his own uh, work as a father and as a leader in a community supporting um, girls' empowerment. Please, could you give us a few minutes? Uh, thank you all. <clears throat> I'm Ziauddin Yusuf Zayan. Uh, I used to be Malala's... Malala used to be my daughter, but now I'm her father. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm really excited uh, to be the part of this Girls' Summit. And for the first time, it's happening. It's very encouraging, Girls' Summit. Itself, it gives a big message. Uh, just to tell you a few things, the time for me is very short. Uh, I'm a father of a daughter, but I, was, I am the brother of five sisters. And usually, when we talk about education in Pakistan or in Nigeria, or are, are in other countries, we think about Taliban or Boko Haram and such organizations. Yes, that is the reality of those countries. But apart from that, in patriarchal societies, women and girls are not encouraged to be educated, to be independent, and to be empowered. So for example, there were no Taliban, but my five sisters could not go to school. And when I was 18 years uh, or 19 years old, I had three sisters older than me and two sisters younger than me. Until I was 19, all my sisters got married. So they went into an oblivion. Believe me, when a girl, for me, the admission of a girl in a school, the access of a girl to a school is and access to recognition. It gives her identity. And my five sisters, they now have a lot of children. And many, many, many women, I just uh, watched uh, a live stream program here of 700. And, and, and it is a report that in today's world, 700 million women, uh, they have been married in early child marriages. And five of them are my sisters. Mm -hmm. So uh, women are usually, when they don't go to school, you will feel that they are never born. They die. When they die, you feel that they, they are never even, they were not ex ex existing in this world. My simple message is, what we can do now, I think that we should work on tomorrow's fathers. Mm. We should work on tomorrow's fathers who are our sons. We should redefine and revisit what a role model father mean, what a role model brother mean. And there we can make a difference. We should introduce good curriculum which teaches about good fatherhood. And with, when it comes to father, why should be I a different father for my son and a different father for my daughter? And I usually give this message to all fathers that don't clip the wings of your daughters. They are meant for stars, and they can fly. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elvin. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know that you're going off to another session. Thank you so much for starting us off with that tone. Um, I'd like to turn to our panelists. Um, uh, for the sake of time and to be able to get quickly to questions from our audience that I know are eager to hear from all of you, I'm going to introduce the panelists as I invite them to speak to us for, for four to five minutes and share their experience. Um, our first panelist who's joining us from Sierra Leone um, is Rugiatu Turai. 
if I'm pronouncing that right, who's the founder of the Amazonian uh, Transformation in, uh, um, Initiative Movement. Um, and uh, I would like to ask you, Rugiatu, if you can talk to us about the community level work that you're doing um, around uh, FGM. Um, thank you very much. Um, Amazonian Initiative Movement, by the name itself, it means strong and fearless women. Knowing the issue we'll be addressing is very sensitive, especially in a country like Sierra Leone, where we still have the government <coughs> resisting to talk about female genital mutilation. And AIM, as we are called, we are involved in working with communities, youths, men, women, schools, and religious places. And we are engaged in adult literacy because after a research we did in 2003, it came out clearly that people, the community, don't have the correct information on the issue why FGM is being practiced. So we think it's important to give more and more information to the community so that the change will come from within the community. And then government will have no excuse to say we cannot take a decision. And therefore, we, um, we establish safe houses because if you give information to children and they make a decision not to go, yet their parents want to force them, they need to have a space to stay. And when we also create schools, in the schools, we make sure we develop manuals on FGM and we teach them in the schools because the change we are looking for is for the next generation. And therefore, you have to give them a sustainable change that is less cheaper, which is education. It's because women are so empowered now that you have so many women taking their rightful position. So we think education is one of the best ways of making a change. We also work with health practitioners because FGM is related to health. We believe the health practitioners have a greater role to play in changing the lives of young girls. Our concern is just for women uh, that practice FGM so they don't lose their status. So we deal with them in um, public speaking so that if you go to their communities and you talk to them, they don't lose their status they still maintain a status, but in a different way. Rather than courting children, they are empowered in be able to read, write their names, and talk in public, and participate in their project. Whereas it was never happening because of the high illiteracy rate in Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone still remains to be one of the few countries that have never passed a law on FGM. And it's still dangerous for people to talk about the issue of FGM in public in Sierra Leone. But we have formed ourselves into a group we call the Forum Against Harmful Practices, and it is comprising of both national and international organizations in all over the district in Sierra Leone. We are engaging traditional leaders because they are the custodians of tradition in our country. We believe for now what we want to do is to make sure everybody in the country come out and speak about the issue of FGM. The first thing is to break the silence surrounding the issue. You talk about it in public, and we want to engage the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Social Welfare, the Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Justice and Education. All these ministries have a role to play in making a change in the lives of women and girls. Education because the children believe in teachers. The local governments, because they work with local councils, and local councils are responsible to develop their own district development plans. We want to see in the future, every council in Sierra Leone, in its district development plan, FGM is inclusive. So it becomes the issue of everybody in the community and the government as a whole. Thank you for giving me the opportunity mm -hmm. to come here and share this experience. Thank you, Agiatsu. Thank you very much. I'm sure that there will be quite a few questions coming your way when we get through. Thank you very much. Um, our next panelist is uh, Naishima Sheikh, 
who's the assistant CEO of the Birmingham and Solihull Women's Aid Organization. Um, I know you're going to be speaking to us for a couple of minutes as well as showing us a short... Um, oh, is that? Okay, right. Then you'll be speaking to us for a few minutes and describing the work. Thank you, Nashim. Okay, thank you. Um, I feel really honored, actually, to be here amongst all these distinguished people. Such a colorful... It's so great. Um, Four years ago, when we embarked on our FGM project, we knew very little about the FGM practicing communities in Birmingham itself. But over the last four years, we've learned a great deal, and it's this knowledge that really makes us passionate advocates of putting the community at the heart of the fight to eradicate FGM. I've been asked to just make three key points. I've been sent about 25 text messages telling me that, so I've got to keep it <laughs> to those three key points. So I would say is, first of all, know your communities. In Birmingham, we have a very wide variety of communities from the Middle East and from Africa. And it would be a mistake for us to lump them all together and think, oh, well, this is how FGM is practiced. Because FGM is practiced across 40 different countries in the world. And with migration and with cultures being dynamic and ever-changing, those FGM practices change all the time. And it can be quite insulting talking to some communities and talking about a form of practice which they don't understand. So one of the things that we've learned is that FGM communities themselves don't know or understand how widespread FGM is, the different types of FGM. All of this is academic. People in the community, actually, for them, FGM is not an issue. It is not something that engages their minds because in Birmingham, anyway, most of those communities are impoverished. Their battles on a day-to-day -day are to get jobs, to get children in schools, to have good health care, to have good housing, things like that. FGM is an issue for the women that it affects. And one of the things that we've also learned in talking with communities is often they think male and female circumcision is exactly the same. They don't really understand the harmful consequences of FGM. And that's why I'm really glad about what you're saying, is that we need to educate people. People themselves don't know. The women who have had FGM done themselves do not understand. This is our experience anyway, because one of the things that we've done is work in FGM uh, clinic in Heartlands Hospital, and the midwife that works there is here today. I don't know if she's in the audience, but I know I've seen her here today. And we support that clinic. And what we found is that women will come in they will be examined. They will say, oh, I've had type 1, which is the least serious type. And actually, after examination, she realized that actually she's had the most serious type of FGM. And that's very traumatic. It's very traumatic to understand that. It's also very traumatic to understand then making the link between all the health problems <coughs> that she has suffered, the gynecological problems, the mental health problems, and then to link those with FGM. That can be quite traumatic. So we provide quite a lot of emotional support. And it's important to understand those messages, to understand what women and what communities themselves actually know about FGM. I would say my third point is to do no harm. And having worked in this field now for four years, I am really quite shocked at some of the ways in which people train around FGM. The videos they, they show which portray a child being cut in a village in Africa, or images they put up about mutilated genitalia. Do they have the permission of that child? Do they have the permission of those women to put up those images? I think what we need to establish is an ethical framework around how we do the fight against FGM. And I think also we need to be mindful in, in, in our work, we have been, of the wider Islamophobic um, context in which the fight for FGM is taking place. Um, do not link FGM practicing communities, for example, with terrorism, as happened at one of our events with an unnamed state agency that decided to, because she had um, 30 to 40 women from a Somali background in, in the hall, decided to start doing a talk <coughs> around terrorism. Um, if we start muddying those, those issues, we are going to lose the fight, because then those are barriers that prevent people coming forward and helping to engage in the fight against FGM. I also feel that there will inevitably be disclosures of FGM, and that's why it's great to have 
our project housed within a Violence Against Women agency where we understand how to address those disclosures and have the appropriate safeguarding practices in place. So one of the things that I will say is that in our fight against FGM, 90% of the communities have said that they will end that practice after a community education programme. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. No, perfect. That's perfect. Thank you for sharing us with that, the, the domestic perspective, really, really important to the panel. I'm going to hand over to Sana Ukpa, who, um, representing Menark, and who is working with uh, Yemeni populations in Yemeni diaspora, engaging communities and talking a little bit about the Little Yemen um, program and your work. Please, Sana. Uh, thank you, firstly, for having me here at the GAS Summit. Um, is my mic on? Yeah? Okay, um, I'd actually like to start with um, a short poem that I wrote on this issue, um, and then I'll go into the, the Lil Yemen campaign. <clears throat> I sit face down with my head on my arms while a pool of tears is flowing in my palms. I'm listening to cries being thrown around and the walls around me are echoing the sound, making it twice as loud and twice as frightening. Conflict is building up like thunder and lightning. I'm only seven years old and I hear her cries. I see her tears in the darkest of nights, and every time his voice is raised, I want to punch his face. I want to hold her close and leave this place, and my heart breaks any time I see her face in my mind. In my mind, I've killed him a thousand times, and I've injected him with the pain that I see in her eyes. How could an angel so pure become a victim of the devil? I'm frozen in time, but my mind never settles. I can't help but think patience killed my mother, and now I'm impatient to kill my mother's lover. They try to beautify these customs, but all I hear is screeches. They say it's in their book, but their book is their preachers. I'm calling out to you, but the scream never reaches. Mother, may your soul rest in peace as my heart lives in pieces. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'd just like to speak about the Lil Yemen campaign. As you said, I work for Menarch, and Menarch is the... Um, is the sole sponsor and the force behind the Lil Yemen campaign. The campaign itself is actually just a few months old um, in comparison to all the other campaigns here. We're very, very um, new and recent. Um, but having said that, we have gained widespread support both in the, U uh, the Yemeni community in the UK and the, the Yemeni community in, in Yemen as well. Um, what we try to do so far is um, we're trying to focus solely on, on changing the mindset of our community. So what we have been doing is um, conducting awareness workshops um, across the UK within, for the diaspora. Um, our first workshop was in Sheffield, which has the largest Yemeni community in the UK. Um, and we understand that in order to get to the root cause of the issues, we must speak and engage with our community on a, on a personal level. And in a way that isn't condescending or patronizing or in a, um, in a superior way, or inferior way, sorry. Um, being of an Arab Yemeni descent myself, um, I only know too well that when you, when you attack or criticize a certain people, um, they automatically get defensive. And when you tell them that, you know, when you point fingers at them and blame them, you say you're, bar you're barbaric and you're backwards, they, ob they obviously will stand up and defend themselves. And they will continue to do um, to take take part in the in the in FGM and child marriage, as a spite, just to be stubborn because they're saying this is our culture, this is our custom. You can't come and tell us that we can't do this. Um, so so what we try to do is um, approach the subject in a cultural culturally sensitive way, um, in a way where we are within the community speaking to the community, not someone from outside coming saying you're barbaric and backwards. Um, so we want to create um, an environment which helps stigmatize uh, the issue of FGM and child marriage. Even though FGM really isn't that much of an issue in Yemen, it's still a problem that we have to deal with <clears throat> on a global scale. What we also try to do, just to wrap up quickly, is um, try to engage our men and young, uh, young boys into the campaign. So uh, at our workshops, um, which will continue in Liverpool, Cardiff and Birmingham, um, we're trying to um, get people to sign, uh, sign a pledge and wear our wristbands, which we can get later on, if you want. Um, and we try to bring the boys on board because obviously they are the future. And, you know, if you're trying to change a perception of a whole nation, it won't really work unless you have the full nation along with you. So we can't be just um, like a feminist groups uh, blaming all evil on men and saying, we don't want your, 
input. No, we need your input because we need to change the whole society. And to change the whole society, we need the whole society on board. Um, and that's it for me. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. We're noting down your questions for our panelists. Um, <coughs> have two more. I'm going to turn next to Sabitra Dakal, who's joined us from Nepal. She's the uh, program manager under care for the Tipping Point program, which focuses on child and early forced marriage. Um, Sabitra, would you mind sharing with us four or five minutes of your experience in engaging whole communities around child marriage? Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm really delighted and excited to be here, and uh, I'm. Uh, to share my experiences or our organizational experiences with the wonderful people of the globe. I'm going to talk on uh, the importance of engaging men and boys in ending child marriage from Nepal. Uh, girls empowerment will not be completed by working only with girls. We might increase girls agency, uh, their aspirations and capabilities, but without changed structures and relationships, their agency cannot be fully exercised. The father at household level who takes most of the household decisions, the married boy who brings a wife to his house after wedding, the male religious leader who creates pressure to uphold traditional thinking, these are key male actors their care is intentionally engaging in shifting inequitable gender power dynamics. In the southern part of Nepal, this is especially important as it is not just girls who are affected by early marriage. Boys and girls are not so different in age when they are married as young children of five, six, or seven years old. A few years then pass between a couple's marriage and gona when the girls begins to live with the boy and his family. Neither spouse has a choice of partner or whether or not to marry at all. It is essential then that we engage boys at a very young age to develop equitable relations even before Gauna. Tipping Point is developing innovative approaches to men and boys engagement that offer structured space for men and boys engagement to reflect on how they have been taught to be a man and how that affects their own well-being and their happiness. Men and boys usually express relief to hear other males' voice or talk about the psychosocial burdens of social pressure on, to dominate women and frustration with their sexual life because it feels like an offensive against their wives. It is too early to measure our impacts, but there are signs that means engagement or awareness is increasing and growing and things are changing. I'm going to share four stories of how men are changing. These stories are from the community level. Panilal, married at age eight, a father at 15, and now with four children, doesn't really remember his wedding. Just that was a big party, and he got to ride in a special carriage to go to the ceremony. He says, if only our parents had not fixed our marriage, at that young age, our lives would have been totally different. If only we were allowed to go to school for more years. Another Bahadur Giri has taken a big step. He says, my son and I talked about it. And we decided that we will not need anything in dowry from a daughter-in-law's family. The newly married couple will be able to have a life without it and dowry leads to many bad social consequences. Anil says, with lots of anger, due to child marriage, I am in this condition. Working as a conditional labor, jobless, illiterate, can't give good education to my kids. My poverty is transferring to my children. Amarnath challenged his family about his siblings' marriage planning and promised to take the responsibility if there happens to be any harm caused by delaying their marriage. Thank you. Thank you, Savitra. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to turn, thank you, Savitra. I'd like yeah. to turn to Agnes Pareo, um, our final panelist, before we turn to questions. And Agnes um, is uh, the founder of, uh, forgive me for the attempt, uh, Tataru Ntumonak. Uh, 
um, initiative um, based in Kenya. Um, and Agnes, could you please spend a few minutes sharing with us a, a bit of, of your own story um, personally and your organization and how it is that you're um, tackling and engaging communities in tackling FGM? Thank you. I feel privileged to speak in this uh, Girls Summit and to share my experiences and what I went through. And I come from a Maasai community in Kenya and the Maasai men are the, the decision makers of their families. And I, was, I went through FGM forcefully by my mother and my grandmother. I tried to say no, and they insisted that I should go through it. I could not say anything because I was 14 years. But after that, I developed that hate in my heart of being forcefully taken through pain with no reason, and I promise that I'll make sure that I will try to make sure that other girls are not cut. And I started engaging the community. I'm trying to use my five minutes. <laughs> I, I started engaging the community because I believe in education. The F FGM is a culture that is deeply rooted among the people who practice it. And they believe in it, and they value it. So if you don't educate them on the effects of FGM and why they should stop it, you will keep talking about it and nothing will ever happen. So I started engaging the parents, that is the elders, women, and boys, because the boys, we call them in our program, the consumers of the brand that we are trying to advertise. And these are the girls. And if they don't marry these girls, then the girls will not agree to stop it. So we engage everybody in the community. We use different strategies. We do uh, outreach, educating the communities on the effects of FGM. We also rescue those girls that run away from FGM. We run a rescue center that where we protect these girls. We take these girls to school because if these girls are not educated, then you will not sustain their decision. We take them to school and after they have gone to school, we also introduce the alternative rites of passage. This is an alternative rites of passage because after the cut, that is when the mother starts talking to this girl in prepar preparation, this girl for marriage. So we are not saying that the whole culture is bad or wrong. We are saying the cut is wrong. So we take the other culture that we think is good by bringing these girls into a five-day seclusion where we take them on on reproductive health issues to understand their bodies, how their bodies development, and to build their own esteem so as to protect themselves and to say no to FGM. And these girls you see there are girls that we also show a model. And the model is meant to make these people understand the types of FGM. Because FGM is a taboo, nobody talks about it. And after it's done on you, you don't even discuss with the other ones. So what happens is that we educate them, we tell them the effects of FGM, we take them to school, and we take them to, through the alternative rites of passage. We are also trying to use the, we have also succeeded in using the law, the existing laws. Because if we cannot bring the governments on board to implement the laws that are existing, they will all be talking of uh, domesticating uh, laws that protect women and girls, or enacting laws that will protect women and girls. And if they are not implemented, they will just be in the shelves and no, nothing will be happening. So as an, as an NGO, we also take these people to court because we bring on board the children's officer who, and the police, and we prose, uh, prosecute the, the culprits who will take through the girls. We also deal with the early marriages because early marriage is a cousin to FGM. If you deal with FGM and leave early marriage, then you, nothing, you have not, you, there, there's not going to be an impact. So we also rescue those girls that are forcefully married because in my community, girls are seen like a source of income. And the parents believe that when they have four girls, they are richer than they were because they'll get a dowry. So we, that's what we do in my organization. And thank you.
Thank you, Agnes, and thank you all of the, our panelists for sharing a huge diversity covering uh, different communities, different continents, uh, both addressing FGM and child and early course marriage. We have successfully managed to communicate quite a lot of information, and I think by my reckoning we have about 10 or 12 minutes um, for any questions uh, coming from the audience. I would ask you to please keep your questions concise. Um, uh, also, to save off any uh, co just comments and speeches of praise to our panelists, we've had amazing amazing contributions and we'll take it that um, we don't need each person standing up to, um, to reflect that. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions and then ask panelists to respond to the ones that you would like to do. So, um, Madame in the front. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. My name is Amina Mohammed. I'm the first lady of Somaliland. It's not actually a question. I just want to add a few notes on what the panel was saying. I identify everything they, with everything they were saying. Yeah. For example, it's no point ostracizing people and criminalizing them from the beginning. So I believe uh, a lot of information giving and targeting the people who are the consumers, like my friend was saying, the young men who are going to marry these girls, for example. Yeah. The mothers, normally they tell you they are doing this because they love their daughters and they want to attract a good marriage for them. That's why they are doing it. So it's a matter of educating the mothers, the fathers, the young men. In my country, for example, we have managed to have this in the open. People can discuss it now. It never used to happen before mm. because we have taken many people on board, the people who had a stake in this, like the religious leaders, for example. Mm. We don't want to bring in legislation now because we want to first educate the people so that we bring in legislation and they are ready for it. Mm -hmm. But if we start with legislation and criminalize people, then you have defeated the subject. So I'm glad it's being handled in a sensitive way because it's a cultural issue, it's a religious issue, it's a peop people issue. They feel this is their culture, this is what they have been doing for centuries, and who are you to tell me you can't do it anymore? So I just want to stress that you know, this is what people should be doing really and thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, can I please take um, Madame in the front and then gentlemen in the back? Um, concise questions, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lita Musimi Ogana, Director of Women, Gender and Development at the African Union Commission. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, first, I appreciate the speakers, but very quickly talk about the issue of backlash. We have uh, championed a lot of uh, 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 activities and uh, campaigns like this one in Africa. And now we are starting to face backlash. And I think we need to, in this forum, think of how we are going to deal with the backlash. Because when you talk about FGM and how you want to eradicate it, you see other people in the street corner organizing to say how they want it. This is a very serious issue. Thank you. Yeah. Question, yes. Um, gentlemen, um, third row back. My name is Obaidurov from Population Council. Yep. Circumcision and FGM is not, you know, same. You know, some of the Muslims believe that the, for men we do circumcision, for female you have to do something. So we have to disseminate in Islam. Circumcision is compulsory, but FGM is not. So that is the, as you say, that you know, if we have to give this information, make it very open and discuss openly, because it is in half of the Muslim world in the South Asia, we don't do circumcision. It is in the Northern Africa and some of the Arab states. So it has to be very clear that it is not Islamic practice. It is cultural thing. So make it very clear. Can I please ask everybody to keep to concise questions for our panelists, please? Madam in the front. We have one question on backlash. Okay, um, merci. Euh, monsieur le modérateur, donc euh, je félicite les panélistes. Je, mon pays, c'est un peu comme le, la Sierra Leone, yeah. le Mali. Okay. Je suis avec la ministre de la Femme de l'Enfant ici. Donc, euh, effectivement, moi, je pense qu'il faut mettre l'accent sur les communautés. Au Mali, nous sommes à 85% des femmes qui sont excisées. Donc, il y a beaucoup de réticence, comme là-bas, surtout les leaders communautaires, sur les religieux musulmans. Donc, il y a beaucoup de réticence. Maintenant, on est parti vers les communautés. Et les communautés sont en train de s'engager maintenant pour l'abandon. Euh, voilà, il y a mille... la question. Ma question, c'est que là-bas, il n'y a pas de loi comme chez moi. Euh, comment ils travaillent avec euh, euh, 
le, la loi, comme, est, comme a été okay, la loi. Comment vous travaillez avec la loi yeah, to, to Parce que nous, notre engagement yeah. pour ce forum-là, c'est de voter avec la loi. Une dernière question, un uh, gentleman qui est ici en front. Je suis Arvind Doja de l'Indie. And I just wanted two things, that there are thousands of small, small initiatives and very good initiatives people are taking all over the world. But how we can scale up? Because we can't wait for a long time. Perfect. So, so that's my, the first question. And I'm going to pause you there and just get a chance to speak to our panelists. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for the concise question. So uh, backlash, how do you deal with backlash? Um, how do you engage with the law and legal structures to promote your aims? And then how do you take successful working uh, and, and plan to grow it um, and take it to scale? Would anybody like to start on one of those? Nishima? Um, but this is why I'm talking about an ethical framework, developing an ethical framework for um, fight against FGM. There was, uh, I, I think it was uh, one university sent out an email saying we should not be showing graphic images, and there was backlash against that. There were lots of people for it, but lots of people against it, saying, no, 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 we need to do this. And I don't think we need to. So, because every time I've had, we're a domestic violence agency. We've been going for 35 years in Birmingham. I have never had more media requests than when we started doing work on FGM. They don't want to know about DV. They want DV, domestic violence. They want to know about FGM. And every time, they want to know about a victim. Have you got a victim? Can, you, can we talk to a victim? Why do we need to have to talk about victims? Why do victims need to talk about their stories? One young girl did that. Um, she's uh, associated with our FGM worker. And the amount of backlash she's got in her community as a result. And we need to safeguard that. Within domestic violence, there is a bit of an ethical framework where we try not to put victims on the panel. Because sometimes the victims, they really want to share their story. They don't understand what their perpetrators can do and what they will be faced with. Anybody else to, to, to engage with backlash or to use of law? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, that's why we are talking about the engagement of different uh, community people. Not only, we are, we are not only working with girls, we are uh, trying to engage men, boys, fathers, and community leaders, policy makers, activists, lots of people we need to want to engage them uh, in ending child marriage and gender-based violence. Uh, What's, what we believe, our organization believes, is when we engage lots of people in ending child marriage and gender-based violence, their perception will be changed. Their thinking will be changed uh, towards, uh, their attitude will be changed towards the goals and towards the rights of girls and towards the gender-based violence. And when the perception of the whole community will be changed, then uh, the community crosses a tipping point. You know, the threshold level of change, the, that um, uh, tr transformational change. That's why uh, th if the whole community will be changed, uh, then girls will be valued yeah, as a human, as an individual, and their potentiality uh, will be valued. And lots of uh, laws and uh, social activities and other activities will be focused for uh, empowering girls. Mm -hmm. That's why. Uh, to minimize backlash and other things uh, that negative consequences, uh, to minimize the negative consequences, we need to engage all actors, yep. not only few actors. Perfect. That's the experiences of our organization. Thank you, Subhita. Yeah. Ugyatu, did you want to respond quickly on the use of law question that came up? Yeah. Yes. Um, for Sierra Leone, what we are doing and we are developing a climate we are in, FGM will be discussed openly by everybody in the country, including politicians who actually will have to make the laws. And for now, we are engaging the communities because politicians are still afraid to talk about this, and we engage the communities for them to know that you can talk about the issue of FGM and even you will be voted for. I took up the challenge when they said in Sierra Leone, if you talk about FGM, you will not be voted for. I contested an election in 2008. Even though they know I am working on female genital mutilation, that people should stop, <coughs> yet I won my election. So I am like a role model to tell politicians that it is not because you talk about a tradition that you will not be voted for, but it is what you do for your people that will make the people vote you in. So you need to be trusted, and I am trusted, and I have the confidence of the people. So for now is to have them talk about it at every level. Because having a law 
is not the best option. It minimizes it and gives the opportunity for those of us working to have protection. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, two, 30 seconds. Sana, did you have something to add? Yeah, just to bounce off um, a, a few points that many of you said. Um, in, terms of, in terms of Yemen or the Arab world, I can say that to avoid having the backlash, we need to gain the support of the religious leaders, like you were saying. Um, and like the, the man was saying at the back, um, it's not, a, it's not a, an Islamic practice, but a traditional custom. Um, so what we need to do is get the leaders on board, and then, um, I mean, the rule, of, the rule of law is basically based on Islam in, in Yemen. So um, one, once you say that Islam does not permit this, there's not really much you can say to, to um, debate that. And four sentences, Agnes, to close us out as the last, last sentence. Yes, uh, we said FGM is a culture that is deeply rooted among the people. It's not easy to talk about FGM, but because we have to save these girls, we must talk about FGM. The only thing that we have to look for is the entry points on how to engage the community, and we must also use the law. Why do we use the law? We use the law because when we go to the girls, we talk to the girls and they say, no, you want to protect these girls, you must use the law. And I have come to find out that the law is an effective tool. Because once a girl has run to you, you want to keep her safe, you want her to go to school, you have to use the law. So when you talk about the backlash, you talk about the backlash because the small community that is trying to say we also want it to continue could not be having information on what happened. But after they are aware, by educating them, I don't think there's going to be any backlash. Because once somebody knows the effects of FGM and is aware of what one goes through, then I don't think there's going to be any backlash. Perfect. Thank you, Agnes, for that last remark. I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing uh, and, and having to condense an amazing wealth of experience um, in the work that you're doing and, and driving and, and, uh, and fostering and eliciting out of the communities that you're working with. Um, I think that the audience I'll ask in a sec to express that appreciation to all of you, not just for what you've shared, but for the work that you're doing day to day um, in applause in a second. But I, I'd just like to respond to the gentleman's question about scale. I'm sorry that we're not going to get a chance to take it up. It is a great segue into an afternoon spotlight session. Um, and those of you who are interested in this session, there, there's a, a companion to this session about taking the great work that is being done at a community level that all of our panelists have talked about and going from hundreds to millions and taking that to scale and I would encourage all of you um, to attend that session. And apologies for not being able to take it up. Um, uh, so with that, I would just like to, um, to say a, a massive thank you to all of you for, for coming and trying to distill down for us the insights that you um, have working at a community level, engaging different stakeholders, um, and responding to a, a tiny fraction of the interest and questions that obviously were here in the audience. So if all of you could please um, give and show your appreciation for our panelists. Thank you very much.